Welcome to Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Moggins. It is March the 20th, 2013, in the uh, throes of a planetary alignment, I'm told, coming off of Mercury retrograde and veering dangerously close to planet Earth. That's where we're at tonight. And uh, as usual, my engineering skills suck. Oh well. Welcome to everybody on the chat room tonight. It looks like we've got a good crowd there as well. And uh, these Wednesday night uh, shows, I'm very encouraged by. I got to say thanks too, by the way, for folks who have uh, kicked in and helped out with the new studio equipment, the new video production re- uh, system that we put online, and. Uh, the change in studio I'm still a little echoey uh, but I'm getting used to it I'm told it doesn't sound too bad um so thanks for those who have helped out that's been tremendous um there is a donate button on the offplanetradio.net site and that's all I'll say about that because um you all know that uh This type of radio is supported by listeners. Um, We do one commercial venture, which is the RNA Drops, which is something I believe in and something that I use. And other than that, we're non-commercial radio. And uh, this show tonight should be pretty epic. It combines two subjects that um, have really been kind of my journey as well. Back in the 1990s, I was part of an online um, Usenet group called the extropians and uh, that was kind of my original introduction to what became uh transhumanism and the singularity that sort of sprung off of the idea of human biological immortality and um, some of the technological things that were going on at that point in time this of course was the early days of the internet so it's been an abiding interest in mine as well as of course the idea of ufology and my guest tonight combines these two subjects in a very interesting way. What's going to happen is next week, March 27th, uh, we're going to run um, Hour 1. Everett Halford's going to be here. He's been with us before. He's been involved with a lawsuit with Fox over copyright infringement for the TV series Fringe, uh, material that was stolen from uh, his books and plays. Ev has actually been writing Fringe material for 12 years or so. He's going to be with us hour one. Hour two, which will probably be an extended hour, is going to be Crystal Clark and James C. Horak. We're going to pick up talking about some of the things that have uh, kind of sprung out of uh, recent shows, including some of the controversial aspects of the uh, George Cavasilis interview. There was uh, some interesting kind of rifts that occurred as a result of some things that George Cavasilis said, and we're going to thresh that out as well. April 3rd, Third to 10th is spring break here. We're taking a two-week break. That gives us time to do some studio upgrades for me to actually sit down and review new material, book some new guests, and launch into a spring season. April 7th, April 17th, we kick that season off. Scott Allen Roberts will be here. 
We're going to talk about the secret history of the reptilians and the rise and fall of the Nephilim. Scott is the publisher of Intrepid Magazine. That's intrepidmag.com. Very interesting guy. We have a lot of common interests, and I think that'll be a pretty ripping show as well. Speaking of ripping shows, I want to bring up my guest right now. He is an author, a anomalist, a researcher, a, a skeptic in the best possible sense, and um, a radio talk show host. Uh, where do we even begin? Television host. My guest tonight is Micah Hanks. Micah, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Randy, my pleasure. Good to be here with you, man. Good to have you on tonight. It's um, you uh, spark some things that really resonate with me. You combine two things in one book title that I was like, wow, that's awesome. Uh, the UFO Singularity. Micah, give us a little bit of background on how you got into studying, researching, and immersing yourself in the paranormal. Well, the paranormal is something that almost comes naturally to me, it's just a shame that you got to have louts on your program like Scotty Roberts. That guy, let me tell you something about him. He happens to be my best pal in the whole world, actually. <laughs> Many of your listeners, I'm sure, know that. Scotty and I, we go way back. I'm also one of the editors of his magazine, Intrepid. So uh, Scotty is uh, probably my dearest friend, and uh, he and I put on the Paradigm Symposium event each year together. And we come from, from very similar backgrounds, really, Randy. You know, uh, Scotty studied theology. Uh, my father uh, is an Episcopal priest. Is that right? Yeah. And, uh, and I liken my own personal experiences with the strange and the unusual to, uh, you know, what you see in the Indiana Jones films. Because uh, I remember I was about to, uh, it actually goes much further back, but for the purposes of tonight's discussion, it's an interesting way to, uh, to look at all this, rather than just saying, uh, you know, my parents tossed books at me when I was a kid that had to do with this sort of stuff. Uh, you know, I remember specifically... I was about 16 years old, and after dinner one night, Dad said, come upstairs, you know, I want to talk to you about something. And I thought, oh, crap, what have I done now? <laughs> you know? and, uh, and I get upstairs, and, uh, and he has this manila envelope. I mean, it's really probably a couple of inches thick, and he just throws this down on his desk and says, take a look through that and tell me what you think. And so sure enough, I crack this, this envelope open, look at it, and it's all this information about a location in the French countryside called Brinsley Chateau. Mm -hmm. which, of course, has been popularized now in the, uh, the books by Dan Brown, The Da Vinci Code, which I understand actually for, I think, uh, the next week or so uh, is going to be available as a free ebook online download to commemorate, I think it's uh, one decade uh, being in print or so, somewhere in that neighborhood. So it just goes to show this is a very popular subject these days. And many years ago, before Dan Brown you know, had uh, taken that and, and made it a popular subject uh, with his book, The Da Vinci Code. You know, there were books like Holy Blood and Holy Grail. Right, Michael like Bayesian, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's actually one title, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. But <laughs> right. uh, those have been popular subjects, uh, you know, among certain circles. And for me, uh, it was it was kind of like that. It was, it was a taboo subject to growing up, especially in, in elementary and, and junior high. You didn't show up and write reports about UFOs and expect to be taken seriously. How funny that uh, here I am, a young man of 30 or so, and, uh, and even still, among the academic world, you don't publicly come out and talk about your academic serious interest in UFOs. And yet, I couldn't tell you, Randy, how many people who are actually academics, who are actually in you know, the, the you know, various fields of sciences, whether it be from you know, microbiology, you know, it could be uh, you know, uh, you know, well, what we might call singularity studies, which we'll get into a little bit later tonight, you know, futurology and all these sorts of things. It could be a number of different interests, you know, philosophy, history. But people do come to me and they say, you know, there is absolutely without question a valid and real phenomenon here when we talk about UFOs, but they aren't really welcomed when they talk about that publicly. So I guess I'm one of those guys, being a journalist, that uh, my reputation's already been uh, you know, soiled, and so I have nothing to lose, and I take it very seriously. And yes, I think that there is, uh, you know, to, again, to kind of paraphrase what the astronaut Edgar Mitchell said, uh, as told to him by those in upper echelons of government, there is a very valid and real phenomenon that constitutes what UFOs may be, and I think it's well worthy of study. You grew up sort of in the era of, of the Internet where these subjects began to be able to breathe a little bit. I mentioned in my intro tonight about the early 1990s being on Usenet groups uh, with these extropian groups. And at that time, alongside of that, there were Usenet groups that were also opening up the, uh, the UFO material, which I have been interested in, much like you, since I was a child. I've been very interested in it because it is something that I believe 
was a real phenomena in my life growing up. I lived during a time of some pretty big UFO flaps here in southern central Pennsylvania where I grew up. So I've had a lifelong interest in this as well. The bane of my life was that for a long time the information wasn't available. The rise of the internet not only opened up avenues for us to have these kinds of discussions, but people your age also grew up with a, a larger availability to more information and the ability to exchange that information. How did that impact you in terms of being able to develop your interests a little bit more, Micah? Well, you know, the information age that we're living in today, Randy, it's obviously having a tremendous impact, not only on my own research, but, you know, on, on the last several uh, generations of, of, of researchers. I was at the uh, International UFO Congress out in Tinte, Arizona, recently, and uh, during a panel discussion with uh, Stanton Friedman, who is approaching 80 years old, mm -hmm. and, uh, and my buddy Rich Dolan, who I know is about 50, uh, you know, Rich was, was uh, answering a very similar question, talking about, you know, photo recognition software that's available to anyone who can, you know, navigate popular search engines like Google, and you can utilize that to be able to determine whether an image may have been doctored or manipulated utilizing, you know, computer-aided graphics and, and, and CGI and the like. Um, and also, for me specifically, the accessibility to a wide range of different kinds of information, uh, that was really formative for me. So in addition to the modern tools that are accessible to the serious ufologist who wants to utilize advanced technologies, you know, for me, especially in, in, in middle school and high school, I, I didn't have direct access to a computer. I don't think we'd have the Internet hooked up at, at my home, but I would utilize the uh, library uh, there at the, uh, at the uh, you know, school. Uh, I would, in addition to some fantastic books by the likes of, uh, you know, Jerome Clark and some of the, the fantastic ufological researchers of yesteryear, and with, with access to the Internet, I was able to, uh, you know, obtain information, and a lot of it, and probably in, in ways that, you know, probably, if not, you know, always in terms of granting access to quality information, I certainly had uh, quicker access to information than, I guess, you know, a lot of my predecessors in this field. Imagine, you know, back in... In the old days, you know, when the, the the original ufologists had to rely on making phone calls and you know placing you know queries and uh, you know of course you know going to the local library and asking for a book to be shipped into their local branch so that they could you know gain access to a, a chunk of information here or there. Nowadays, you know, all you have to be able to do is go on Google and type in a keyword or a search term. In addition to all the blogs and other kinds of resources that have made, been made available. There's always, like I said, good with the bad. You know, I think that uh, what's questionable is the, uh, the quality of the information yeah. because there is so much available. And I think that the modern ufologist has to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff and know what to look for and know where the reputable sources are. But by the same token, again, as opposed to having to go to the National Archives or visit Washington, D.C., you go up to Canada and, you know, request their Canadian National Archives, you can access the uh, declassified UFO files from government bodies and different organizations of officialdom from all around the world through your home uh, personal computer. So it certainly uh, influenced my own research in the way that young ufologists like myself go about UFO research because we have access to decades and decades of official documentation that back in the day people had to really work to get. I almost feel lazy at times because, again, you know, before coming on the program tonight, I was literally browsing uh, Canada's library and archives uh, collection, which is collectionscanada.gc.ca, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. look at 1947 era, uh, you know, Canadian UFO files from their archives. So it's something anyone can access, and it really has changed the field and certainly made my job a lot easier. In addition to doing UFO research, Micah, do you also do other types of paranormal, anomalous type research? I, I, I kind of include you in a vein of uh, people I would call Fordians in terms of dealing with anomalous research. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Charles Fort, of course, uh, is, is the man from whom the term Fordian is derived. Uh, in, a, in a blog post I did a while back for Intrepid Magazine, uh, I talked about uh, mysterious Fortean disappearances, and someone had uh, gotten on there and tried to correct my grammar and said it's 14, F-O-U-R-T-E-E-N. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, obviously it just shows how oblivious people are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and snarky at times. Uh, Fortean, again, is, is a term that, uh, you know, bears not only the name of, of the researcher for whom it's named, Charles Fort, but it also is something that is very all-encompassing, and yes, uh, very much so, I'm a Fortean. You know, I, I really kind of cut my teeth writing articles about 
cryptozoology as it relates to linguistics and, 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 and uh, you know, sociology. Uh, my first article published in Fate Magazine many moons ago was uh, titled Voices in the Dark, Do Sasquatches Have a Language? And now I'm actually a consulting editor to the very magazine that gave me my big break, Fate Magazine. And, um, you know, it's been an institution since around 1948, you know, one of the, the key resources yeah. for Information yeah, absolutely. on flying saucers and, uh, and the like. And, and yeah, you know, my, my personal interests have run the gamut, uh, you know, from cryptozoology to uh, ghosts and hauntings, you know, strange physics aberrations, which I kind of tie in with modern uh, discussions of, of UFOs. And even outside the realms of Fortiana, you know, I've, I've also taken a serious interest in, in conventional history as well as economics and politics and things like that. Really, you, you have to be, in order to be effective, I think, Randy, you have to be all inclusive in your interests. You have to really try and be as as, as multi genre as you possibly can. Yeah, well, it, everything that we talk about somehow streams into something else, which is why I kind of pulled in the fourteen influences because in going into the conversation we're going to have tonight about the singularity in UFOs, we are still dealing with something that's amorphous, something that we're poking around in the dark to do, to discern what it is and i get the sense looking at the material you've produced and and researching what you've put out there that you're kind of that guy too we're kind of whacking the bushes trying to figure out what is this what is that what do we call it because phenomenologically sometimes we're dealing with what i consider to be multiple things lumped into one ball that we put under the heading of paranormal or ufos well, absolutely, and that's the whole thing is that uh, people say, what do you think UFOs are? Do you believe in aliens? And, of course, uh, I'm, I'm naturally casting myself as the pariah because while giving a lecture recently at the International UFO Congress, I think I was the one speaker who got up and uh, looked the audience in the eye, at least best I could with bright light shining in my own eyes, and, uh, and, and told them, I've, in my experience, in my research, uh, you know, which has spanned more than a decade of serious, you know, daily probing of this phenomenon and the available literature and, and, and of course my own personal field work just as well interviewing people I've never found a shred of evidence well no I've, I've found a lot of compelling evidence but I've never found a shred of absolute proof uh, that points us uh, definitively in the direction of extraterrestrial phenomenon underlying the UFO phenomenon uh, but I would tell you this while that is maybe a strong possibility for a minority of the cases really to say that UFOs must be in totality, this or that is doing it a disservice because, in my opinion, UFOs are probably, as you've kind of already outlined, they're probably a variety of different things. They may be secret government uh, aircraft that are being utilized for test purposes and or surveillance or any number of things. Drones are really a game changer in modern times in that uh, you know line of thought. There's always the possibility that there are extraterrestrial aircraft visiting Earth. I could not prove that to you, and I don't think I've found, uh, in my experience, uh, you know, without question, hard proof of extraterrestrial visitation as so many others would try and assert that they have access to or that, you know, ufological studies uh, is in itself evidence of. I don't think that's the case at all. There could be any number of other potentials, you know, time travelers from our future, all different kinds of other things. In, in my gut, I have a strong feeling that probably it's the minority of these cases that are something truly extraordinary, but nonetheless that there are extraordinary anomalous phenomena that can't be explained by a mere cursory examination of the history of ufology alone. You can't lump it all under just, you know, secret government aircraft and test craft and things like that either. There's obviously something more going on here, but it's probably a variety of different things working in collusion with other, or one another, or maybe perhaps, uh, you know, completely apart from one another, and nonetheless, which constitute that, that fabled and, and heralded uh, ufological uh, you know, what if that we deal with today. Unidentified flying objects come in many different shapes and sizes, and they probably have a lot of different points of origin just as well. And again, you know, this is kind of the juggernaut we deal with because of the uh, multifaceted aspects of the phenomena itself. And then the quandary that we have abstracting statistics, understanding anecdotal evidence, um, vetting witnesses. My area of inquiry has been <clears throat> sort of diverged a little bit from ufology into um, government mind control programs. And as I began to do more in the area of mind control, I found overlaps that disturbed me. And 
I, I would say in the last two years, I've become increasingly disturbed by the overlap in these. Not to be able to explain exactly how everything interweaves, but the fact that in discussing um, details of, for instance, people who believe they've been in an abduction scenario and people who have been in mind control programs, I note similarities as well. And it's a, it's it's delicate ground we walk because there's clearly there are clearly things out there, Micah, that are disturbing that people have experienced and that have traumatized them. And we have to be respectful of of people who come forward with their stories because one of the things that I've not wanted to do was have a chilling effect on people to tell their stories. What is your experience in talking to people uh, around these particular areas, people who maybe have had what they consider to be abduction experiences or people who have been involved in what they believe to be government mind control programs? Well, you know, uh, in, in my experience, I've, like most ufologists, I've, I've, I've you know, been very interested in the abduction phenomenon. Uh, researchers the likes of John Mack and, uh, of course, the late Bud Hopkins mm-hmm. with Strieber, who I've, I've had the pleasure finally of you know being able to speak to. I always had hoped one day to be able to interview him. And, yeah, Whitley was with us last year. He's <laughs> you know, again, truly, um, uh, as I said in my book, uh, because so many people are dismissive of alien abduction phenomenon these days, and we'll get to that in just a moment. I think that, that really is in the direction of what you're asking with your question. But because people are so dismissive of it, uh, there was some controversy, very sadly, right before uh, Bud Hopkins' death with regard to the merit of his research. Uh, and so it, it, it's kind of caused a lot of people who are the hardline, serious ufologists to question the nature of alien abduction. Now, I definitely think that there's merit to the research, although I do think that at times it's important to break the two phenomena, UFOs and abduction research, apart and look at them separately. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in my book, I would said, you know, despite what you may think of his credibility or essentially, and what I should have said to turn this more carefully, uh, what you may think of abduction research on the whole, and then I you know, quoted Whitley Strieber, who brilliantly breaks apart the different possibilities and potentials in, re- in regard to his own experiences with non-human encounters, and he does so without having to really uh, cater entirely to the extraterrestrial me. He goes through everything from what if the, you know, the spirits of our dead are behind this? What if it's time travelers from the future? What if it's you know, some sort of a terrestrial phenomenon here based here on Earth? You know, he truly brilliantly goes into it, and uh, I'd always wanted to be able to interview Whitley. And then the book, The UFO Singularity, uh, my latest book on UFO, UFOs, came out. So, you know, Whitley read it, uh, chose to interview me on his program, Dreamland, and then he asked me, but what do you mean by, uh, you know, if, what, despite what you think of Whitley Stever's credibility? And so I took great delight in explaining, uh, you know, to Whitley and to his audience that I think people who look at alien abduction today in the context of being ufological are often, uh, you know, kind of, you know, brushed aside. And, and it's not, you know, fair to do that because, if anything, guys like Whitley Strieber have lent incredible, innumerable contributions to the field. And so what I ask the ufologist of today to do is to suspend your disbelief and hear what people like Whitley Strieber have to say. I think that there's a very important important kernel of truth to be found in Whitley's writing that so many ufologists and abduction researchers alike uh, you know, almost systematically overlook, Randy, and that is this, that we may not be dealing with an, a, a, a full, you know, blooded, flesh and blood uh, extraterrestrial phenomenon here like so many have asserted. Uh, even Whitley had said, let's look beyond that and let's just accept this, this, you know, ongoing interaction for what it is, which is something truly anomalous, but something that seems to extend well beyond what humans are meant to understand and, and what is, you know, uh, within the realm of the daily... Uh, experience that we you know the normal experience if you will and he even went so far as to say what if this is the experience uh as interpreted by the human mind uh of essentially our evolution what if this is how the mind interprets conscious evolution so uh, it was so interesting to speak with Whitney Strieber and look at the parallels uh between UFO uh, UFO phenomenon uh alien abduction as we know it uh, as we call it uh, and, you know, also the differences, and to say maybe there is an ongoing interaction between humans and non-humans, maybe that's not represented necessarily by UFO phenomenon, but you can't discount that abduction phenomenon is something worthwhile and of great importance. Now, in the, the UFO singularity, there's an entire different side of that that I'll look into, again, that Strieber and I uh, discussed, and it has to do with my labs and 
And I think that's something that you've mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. certainly spent a good bit of your time, you know, researching yeah. in the past, which has to do with the potential that there is actually, you know, an element of control, a pervasive element, and nonetheless something that works behind the scenes here on Earth that is seeking to, uh, you know, implant probes and, and other kinds of uh, devices within human beings. Uh, for ongoing purposes of, of surveillance, or maybe even ongoing purposes of some sort of different, uh, you know, mechanical uh, study uh, of, of some variety. You know, literally studying the mechanization, uh, or, or, or rather the inner workings of the human mind, in ways that that perhaps can even be controlled. So it's a very disturbing element. And in, in the UFO singularity, I look at uh, in, the, in the fifth chapter of the book, People from the Sky. I look at some of the stories of people who have experienced abductions, but they don't describe being abducted by aliens or non-human beings. Their experiences typically involve people just like you or I within the context of a very familiar environment, a meme, if you will, within alien abduction literature. People are being taken, they're paralyzed, and they're having different kinds of mechanical devices and played within their bodies for different purposes. It's obviously very invasive. It's obviously very real. They can't make any sense of it, and often there is a UFO component uh, involved in this just as well. So, again, I think it's important to acknowledge that there is serious merit to studying abduction research, but that we may want to look at that at times outside of the study of alien cosmology and even at times outside the context of UFO studies just as well. You, you realize that, that this spins off in a thousand different ways. Um, I had a question in the chat room, and you partially answered the question, but uh, the uh, person in the chat room asks, uh, what sparked your interest? Have you seen any UFOs or had contact of any kind? That's a good question. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of those boring individuals who um, has had very limited personal experience. With, with the UFO uh, phenomena. And I think it's important to point out right now that um, I call myself a skeptic. And uh, I have colleagues uh, who I guess would call themselves more skeptical than I am. And then I have colleagues that would balk at that term. Mm-hmm. Uh, people who I respect and people who I work with regularly. Uh, you know, um, I mean, I have friends in ufological circles who uh, will tell you, you know, I've seen UFOs, um, and the technology I saw was nothing that could be of this world. I am convinced that there is evidence that strongly uh, points toward an extraterrestrial component. You know, I have other colleagues like Sharon Hill of the fantastic website Doubtful News, who is what I would call a very moderate but serious skeptic. And she is the kind of individual who, you know, badly wants for there to be evidence of something like this, but, you know, adheres to, uh, you know, scientific consensus and, 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 and a very rational, logical approach to studying strange phenomena and often errs on the side of, well, you know, we wish that there was evidence that, again, conclusively showed us alien visitation has been ongoing for centuries and centuries, if not thousands of years. Uh, but, again, there isn't a lot of, you know, hard evidence that supports that conclusion. And we have to err on the side of you know, conventional scientific uh, understandings of the nature of reality. I put myself in the center, and I still call myself inherently skeptical. Maybe part of that is because I haven't had those personal experiences. But, you know, I guess to answer the other half of the question, then what drives me toward it, well, it is a desire to understand. And I'm, I'm not a denialist. I'm not a person who's going to say, well, there may be science, there may be evidence that does support something beyond what our conventional perspective right. reality will allow and I'm just going to deny that because science doesn't uh, typically uh, you know uh, uh, allow for that or or uh, you know condone that line of thought you know I'm very open minded I'm willing to be very uh, inclusive of different ideas and opinions I do prefer when the evidence uh, you know points strongly in one direction or another and I tend to gravitate toward where the evidence and the factual data will direct me, but by the same token, having not had an experience, what I think drives me into wanting to do this is the search for the serious, the hard evidence, the proof. I've seen very little. There is a lot of compelling evidence, and all I can tell you that that has shown me thus far is that, again, with ufology and with a variety of other different kinds of unexplained phenomena, I think that there's enough data at least to be able to consider that there is something going on that extends well beyond the general consensus opinions of our scientific establishment, something also that maybe extends beyond the general limits of human physical perception, and yet that remains, un, you know, if not completely un, uh, understood, it's at very least misunderstood, and, and, and that we're dealing with different kinds of uh, phenomena that maybe I think in the future, once we utilize more advanced technologies, this kind of gets into the realm of transhumanism, 
I think that and probably within the next couple of decades, we will begin not only to recognize more fully that there are unexplained phenomena in our midst right now that can be studied with the utilization of practical sciences and different kinds of technological implements in the coming decades, but also we will also begin to probably, if anything, prove certain things that remain unproven and thus paranormal or pseudoscientific in the world today. And that's where I go with the UFO singularity, is looking at trends of current science today, where we're going with that, what we can expect in the coming decades, and how we will filter our perspectives on such things as ufological studies through advanced sciences of tomorrow. Now, the term singularity is a much earlier term than what we call transhumanism. The term itself migrated over from another discipline, and maybe you can kind of connect that for me a little bit if you're familiar with that. Absolutely. Yeah, when, if we want to talk about singularity, I think that really the, the origin of the word, there's something of a singularity archetype, um, maybe even in earlier terminology outside the, uh, the scope of technological singularity and, of course, later on transhumanism, may have essentially meant a, you know, kind of the, the, mel the melding of the human spirit or mind or body with something, you know, or maybe even the melding of mind and body. Now, uh, by around the 1950s, the term singularity or similar terminology had been employed by I. J. Good and a few others, uh, mathematicians, you know, physicists and the like. Uh, the popular use of the term uh, didn't actually originate until around maybe 1982 or 1983 when Werner Vinge, also a mathematician, mm -hmm. and of course a, a science fiction author, uh, and a very good one as well, uh, Werner Vinge uh, referred to a point in, at which you know man's technology would uh, essentially begin to escape us. Uh, most people uh, view this as being the, uh, the genesis of or creation of artificial intelligence, and furthermore, uh, a perhaps a self-replicating variety of technological intelligence that will literally be capable of improving upon itself so rapidly that it will eventually literally escape human understanding, if not of the man of tomorrow, it's certainly something that is very difficult for us to conceptualize today. And so Werner Vinge used the expression singularity in reference to the event horizon of a black hole in saying that much like the event horizon of a black hole, the uh, genesis. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, much like the event horizon of a black hole, our conception of space, time, matter, and reality breaks down somewhat uh, when we try and look at that model of existence. And literally, the modern futurologist, the likes of Ray Kurzweil, he calls himself. I think preferentially a singularitarian right, right, yeah. in this term, uh, he would say that by the year 2029, which is again within the next couple of decades, we're going to be a, begin to see the beginnings of this kind of trend toward artificial intelligence and perhaps even in artificial intelligence as we can self-replicate, which leads to what Vinge alluded to decades ago, an intelligence explosion. It's going to be a very exciting period, but something that also escapes the general conception of what life on planet Earth will be. In fact, Werner Vinge referred to it as potentially the end of life as we know it on Earth. But maybe not the end of humanity as a species, rather it would be the beginning of a bridge, okay, or a, the beginning of a path toward becoming something that we perhaps are today but will not be once we implement such advanced technologies in the future. And so this is where transhumanism comes into the discussion about singularity. The Singularity Institute describes singularity as being the creation of intelligence that is smarter than human intelligence, which gets into not only artificial intelligence, computers that are smarter than humans potentially, but also technologies that will allow human beings to modify themselves physically and perhaps improve our own natural levels of intelligence, and hence we take evolution effectively into our own hands, and yes, this is something that uh, many call transhumanism. It's not exactly a comfortable subject for many people, and I'm neither you know, an adherent of it or necessarily someone who stands athwart the ideas of transhumanism and singularity. I, I try to remain unbiased, and as a reporter, as a journalist, I, I merely bring you the facts, but uh, as Kurzweil has said, the singularity is indeed near, and what it means for humankind, uh, there are a lot of possibilities and potentials, but I couldn't tell you conclusively what that is or whether it will be ultimately good or bad. Yeah, and truthfully, it's difficult sometimes to conceive of the idea that humanity, that our, 
our present intellectual development can create something that can outstrip us uh, in terms of processes. I interviewed um, Dr. Roman Yampolsky, and, and he basically said the same thing. He said software is now self-improving and that we'll basically begin to outstrip the human level intelligence if we do not begin to contain it. And he was talking at it from the side of, you know, basically being a software engineer. But it seems like a difficult concept to understand that we could be overtaken by technology because something must drive that technology or control that technology in a meaningful way. In your research, what did you learn about the development of AI and the rapidity of development against our current um, intellectual development as a species? Those are very good questions, very complex. Um, first, I would like to say, uh, well, in, in relation to what I've learned about AI, I've learned that uh, there are some fascinating studies uh, taking place right now that I, I suppose that most people are largely unaware of. Speaking with a colleague overseas about this recently, we were discussing what is known as the dot test of consciousness, where you can, you know, for instance, you might take a little, little sticker uh, and place it on someone's forehead. Now, you or I would easily look in the mirror, see the sticker there, and if you or I hadn't placed the sticker on our forehead, we'd naturally reach up and our attention would be drawn to it. We would want to know what this sticker on our forehead is. Now, a little child, maybe you know, younger than a year old or so, mm -hmm. is largely incapable of looking into a mirror and recognizing the mirror as being a reflection of oneself and thus looking at the dot that's been appended to their forehead, realizing what's that doing there? It's not supposed to be there. It doesn't belong there. And then reaching for their own forehead after seeing their reflection and trying to remove it. And, you know, after, you know, so many months, uh, the, uh, the development of the brain in conjunction with the child's natural rate of growth uh, allows for conscious uh, behavior to, begin to, uh, to take place. And then the child begins to, uh, you know, first be able to look into a mirror and recognize the reflection in the mirror as being a reflection of oneself. And therefore, if they have something drawn on their face or if there's a little sticker on their forehead, they'll, they'll recognize that image that they're seeing in front of their eyes as being a reflection of themselves, and they will react to the image by reaching up and trying to pull the sticker off their forehead. Fascinating are the studies that show that certain animals, pigs, dolphins, and others, are capable of passing this dot test, which shows that they are also self-aware of the fact that they're looking at their own reflection in a mirror. And there are some studies that have taken place in Japan with regard to varieties of different, I wouldn't call them necessarily artificial intelligences, but robots by, you know, uh, that, that, that for various different uh, practical applications are capable of, of, of observing themselves uh, and, and, and becoming aware of certain things going on in their environment. Certain robots have been capable of passing the dot test. Uh, so now, does that mean that these robots are self-aware? It maybe shows that there are mechanical applications, synthetic processes that are being applied to machines that have the rudiments of self-awareness and the rudiments of consciousness. I don't think that we can safely say yet that there are machines that have been designed that mimic, uh, you know, the, every aspect and every uh, you know, minute facet of human consciousness. But I've certainly learned that there's a lot more going on out there than most people are already aware of. Uh, now, I want to backtrack a, a bit uh, because you mentioned software engineers, and I want to say that uh, there are so many people who are involved in computer science who are really uh, key not only to artificial intelligence research, but also ufology, and I want to also use that as a springboard toward mm -hmm. beginning to you know, draw the, the necessary parallel between artificial intelligence research and ufology, which is what I've tried to do with my book, The UFO Singularity. Uh, Jacques Vallée, who is arguably one of the finest you follow mm -hmm, yes. on his time, yeah. you know, certainly very instrumental in, in my own uh, you know, progression of thought and in, in, in the study of UFOs over the last several years. And Jacques Vallée also is uh, an entrepreneur, you know, and he's, he's very much you know, uh, uh, a well-known figure in Silicon Valley, and he's, of course, been very involved in uh, everything from the, uh, you know, the beginnings, the rudimentary uh, you know, renditions of what later became the World Wide Web to all, all different other kinds of, of software and, and, and computer applications. In, I think, 1976, he and a colleague, Francois Meyer, co-authored a paper that talked about, uh, essentially, the, the rate of growth of human technology and, of course, uh, juxtaposed this alongside uh, you know, human population growth and uh, the potentials uh, or the pot potential perils, I suppose, of overpopulation. And uh, charted graphically within the article, uh, 
Ballet, back in 1976, noted that the rate of growth of our technological applications is greater than exponential. It's it implied that graphically it's hyperbolic. In other words, it's growing more quickly than exponential. The reason why that, uh, this is taking place is because all of our technologies, Randy, are at a point, especially, and have been probably for the last several decades, where new innovations influence the next set of new innovations. I mean, you have three or four different innovative areas of science that are innovating a, a, an entire host of different innovations, perhaps in largely unrelated fields. There is a cumulative rate of growth, and there's more science, and there's more technology. And the more quickly that our advancements in technology continue to grow, and the more actual technological applications that are innovated and created, the greater the rate of growth of our technology, and it's begun already to grow at a greater than exponential rate. This is what's called by many futurists the law of accelerating returns. And Jacques Vallée, ufologist and software engineer, had pointed this out essentially in an article with his colleague Francois Meyer back in 1976, and had said that this... Uh, when taking into consideration the the uh, equally <laughs> greater than exponential rate of, of, of growth of population worldwide of human beings uh, could only inevitably lead to some singular point. Now, he didn't call this singularity. He thought that this would be something that would probably, if anything, have negative uh, impacts on on humankind, but uh, as to speculating uh, as so far as what that actual event will be, uh, it was beyond the scope of the conversation. But I bring that up just to say that, you know, computer scientists who manage to look at the nature of reality and they take things such as, you know, population growth, the rate of growth of technology, and they look at these things statistically utilizing computer programs, you know, whether it be human population growth, technological uh, applications, or even maybe UFO sightings charted graphically, yeah, yeah, or you know, or plotted graphically. You know, I think that uh, utilizing statistics and computer sciences is key in understanding trends that we can utilize a body of systematic data and information that we've collected over maybe a period of several decades and applying that to where we think we're going to go in the future. And so it's interesting that the computer scientists of yesteryear were often the very ones who are seeing these trends in technological growth that the futurists of today call transhumanism and singularity. Some of those very same researchers have been ufologists just as well. And so with the UFO singularity, something I've tried to do is to take all these things into consideration, the importance of computer science, uh, the serious uh, rate of growth of, of our technology today, the serious practical applications of advanced artificial intelligence and other what we might call singularity sciences, whole brain mapping, nanotechnology, a host of other different kinds of things like that, and apply these systematically to trends in technology as they pertain to UFOs. I think that there's a lot that we can learn, and you know, to put it concisely, at some point we may literally not have the answer to the UFO enigma, but if we reach a point where we have a functional form of artificial intelligence, that uh, artificial intelligence may be, you know, such a variety of intelligence and, and may have access to certain systems of data and other kinds of information that uh, we could ask, what is the nature of the UFO phenomenon? And who knows, within, you know, <laughs> a few milliseconds we'll have an answer uh, that is far better than anything that you or I could sit around and spend several decades trying to come to terms with. So, again, it's very important to look at artificial intelligence, computer science, and as I've done with the UFO singularity, how these things relate to a phenomenon in our midst today that already, as the Singularity Institute defines singularity, that already appears to exceed natural levels of human intelligence. I think there's a clear, distinct parallel between the two, and frankly, I think that one's going to lead us to a better understanding of the other in just a few years. Again, it, it kind of begs the question from my perspective, which... <laughs> Maybe my, my my ability to abstract some of this is limited. If we create something which is greater than us, which then becomes the master? Because we look, we're, we're, we're talking here from a, a scientific standpoint, Micah, and we're, we're, we're quantifying and we're qualifying things. So we have a quantitative rate of knowledge, we have increased capacity for processing, but in the midst of all that, there's an X factor, and that is consciousness itself, and how that interplays, because even defining consciousness is somewhat slippery. I, I'm not satisfied that in decades of looking at this question, I've gotten a hard answer on it, but there's something there that I call the X factor, which is consciousness, which is the spark in the human which theoretically should keep pace with 
the advancement in technology which has been spawned from our own human intelligence. Do you deal with that at all in, in, in your research? Well, you know, one of the, the most important things, uh, you know, to all of this is understanding in totality the human being. You know, I, I, I like to make sure that uh, with all my uh, <laughs> fanciful talk about uh, future science, and potentially the uh, the uh, institution of technologies that uh, you know maybe not only exceed human intelligence but that exist apart from it, intelligent machines. Uh, before we reach that point, I think that there's a lot that we have yet to discover and and understand fully in relation to the inner workings of the human mind and consciousness. So yes, absolutely, my research uh, encompasses a lot of that. We have to take those things into consideration, and because of the inerrant questions that remain uh, with regard to you know, human, uh, you know, consciousness, whether consciousness or the mind is something that can exist apart from the brain is, you know, again, looking at other areas of phenomenology as maybe remote viewing and, uh, and astral projection and these sorts of spiritual sciences might uh, suggest if those, are, if those claims would be believed. I couldn't tell you again whether or not those kinds of things uh, have any validity, but I do know that they've been taken seriously enough by government agencies and organizations you know, uh, so as to warrant serious, uh, you know, taxpayer-funded research into uh, whether or not those things can be utilized for practical purposes such as espionage and things like that. But uh, to come back to the question of consciousness, this has been a, a great enough problem for many that it seems to actually, uh, you know, derail in the mind of some, I think, uh, in the mind of some researchers, I would imagine, the notion that we will eventually reach a point where we create artificial intelligence. And what we may actually do instead is uh, supplement uh, or supplant aspects of known biology with digital substructures and the like, utilizing advanced technologies. And we may, rather than creating artificial forms of intelligence, in order to get to a point where we fully understand ourselves, we may first have to implement artificial components within existing humans. Again, this is something that a lot of people would view as, you know, playing God. It's mm -hmm. you know, rather unwholesome. You know, that's not my choice uh, to, to, you know, to, to make that uh, determination or to stand behind a, a for or against, you know, um, you know stance in that regard. I, but, I, but I do think that, again, that it, there are enough questions about human consciousness that remain and, and, of course, the inner workings of the human, not just the mind itself, but, you know, the body and the capabilities of the human body in relation to the mind, perhaps, that warrant, uh, you know, uh, looking carefully at whether, you know, it's going to be artificial intelligence first, or it's going to become a new kind of human intelligence, because perhaps to get to that point where we fully understand ourselves, we will have to implement uh, scientific processes and technologies that allow us to better, uh, if not study, perhaps prolong the the life of and, and, and even the, you know, the ability for per, uh, certain parts of the mind and the body to exist apart from what we would call conventional human of today for purposes of study. Again, it's a bit of a hairy subject, but uh, you know, we have to understand ourselves fully before we can really uh, you know, completely understand where we're going to be going with this and what else we might be able to uh, create in our own image at some point. Right, and, and, and you, know, the, you, you raised an interesting point there um, because we've talked about, I think, an increase in capacity intellectually and perhaps even creatively, but the physiology of what we're talking about, if we talk about... Um, for instance, what I guess would be the cyborg scenario, um, the human biology has certain limits to it and in, in, of what it can withstand. Even the placement of um, what we would call nanos into the human body creates what would be foreseeably a stressor on the electrical system of the body. In your research, did you find people who were dealing with this, who were dealing with, for instance, augmentation, the so-called super soldier projects, where there's ongoing efforts, and some people believe, and I've talked to people who tell me that they have augmented the human biology to various degrees or another. Did that show up in your research? It does from time to time. Uh, I had a funny uh, thing happen again uh, during my uh, trip to Arizona uh, earlier this month, the International UFO Congress. I was uh, catching up with uh, my friends David and Claude at Cuba, uh, having breakfast, and a gentleman came and sat down next to us, and I'd gone uh, to uh, get a, a refill of the delicious latte that I was having. Uh, I am indeed a coffee drinker, as I think a lot of researchers <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no, uh, anything. Yeah, was, yeah, no, we're totally addicted and probably <laughs> uh, sleep deprived as well. You know what I'm talking oh, about. Oh, I do, I do. Yeah. Well, matter of fact, it's sad because, you know, uh, I already had an iced coffee here. I was finishing up and I had to prepare a large mug of oolong tea. So I've actually got a, a half drank. Uh, uh, iced coffee and an, an oolong. Tea. Nice. <laughs> I'm taking the airways with you here, Andy. So, <laughs> you know, I'm the proof in the pudding right now. But uh, as I was sitting down, uh, returning with my latte at, uh, at breakfast, which normally I'm a black coffee guy, but since I was out of town, I was I was splurging a little bit. Uh, there was a, a fella uh, who was at an adjacent table who I'd noticed and engaged my friends, the Hubers, in conversation, and he was pointing at my book. I'd, I'd given them a copy of the UFO Singularity, um, and uh, he was pointing at this and said, oh, this has to do with transhumanism, and you've got to check this out. And turns out the fellow was a, uh, a fairly well-known uh, Irish researcher by the name of Miles Johnson. Oh, yes. I know who Miles Johnson is, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and so it was Miles, and that's how I was introduced to Miles. And he says, what is this book? And I said, well, it's my book. Do you own it? No, I wrote it. <laughs> and so Miles and I start talking, and he, um, he, he brought this, this really bizarre um, documentary to my attention, which I since, uh, having spoken with him, I, I've watched it, and it's as strange as he said it was. It's called Madness in the Fast Lane. Are you familiar with it? Yes, I am. And, you know, I don't know what to make uh, of that film. Uh, again, I think uh, much like uh, Dr. Benjamin Simon said of Betty and Barney Hill, it was a shared psychological aberration. Uh, as, at least that was the official explanation for the strange behavior of the two women in that film. It's online, and I recommend people watch Madness in the Past. I think actually that's posted somewhere on my website, but it's probably buried deep down. Go ahead, tell, tell the people what it is again. Well, you know, the story, the story <laughs> basically has to do with two sisters. Yes. And uh, I think they were actually... Uh, apprehended in this incident uh, in, in England, but they were from, uh, oh gosh, they were probably somewhere from, uh, you know, uh, um, in, in Eastern Europe. Yes, I, I think that's the way I recall it, too, yeah. The two, the two uh, they were twin sisters, you know, a bit strange looking, you know, but more probably, a, uh, you know, well, at least it was implied that this was a result of just their, their ethnicity, you know, where they were actually from, but uh, the two sisters uh, were spotted on a uh, I guess on a highway camera walking down, uh, you know, in a rather dangerous location between two uh, 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 lanes of fast moving traffic. And uh, there was a, a documentary type television program that had to do with paramedics, you know, who would arrive on the scene, you know, yeah, and, yeah. You know just with, with traffic accidents and things like that. And so they were, they had a cameraman in the car with them and they, uh, they had gotten to the scene and they were, you know, essentially only planning on going to see what in the world these women were doing. And uh, they, the two women, uh, and this is as the cameras are rolling, they run out into traffic and they, they run into moving vehicles. One of the women is completely disabled. Her, her legs are smashed. The other is knocked completely unconscious. And so as the paramedics are tending to the one woman who is knocked unconscious, the other, completely void of any obvious, absolute crippling pain she should have been feeling, starts screaming at the person who's over there trying to help her angrily. She's, she's verbally attacking them. Well, the, uh, the other sister who had been knocked unconscious, she gets up. She's acting, again, very angry and starts waving her hands and then runs out and gets, I think, hit by another vehicle. And at this point, you're just thinking, my God, how are they, you know, are they on drugs? Apparently, there were no substances that were found in their bodies. But the, the woman who had escaped, uh, captured twice and was able to be struck on a, by a vehicle, uh, they, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, there's, of course, are police officers on the scene at this point. They, so they attempt, attempt to try and apprehend this woman. They're holding her back, and as they get the camera over on her, she's shouting something along the lines of, they're going to take our organs. <laughs> I have to say it's just one of the most absolutely strange films we've ever seen. And then within, I think, 48 hours, that same woman had been taken into the home of a man who had thought that she was homeless and that she needed a place to stay in. You know, she had, you know, she stabbed the man. Killed yes, him. again. Yeah. So it was a very, very strange film. Uh, again, the conventional explanation was that two women were sharing some sort of a strange psychological condition, some sort of a disorder. But many have said, well, first of all, we have a lot of problems here. These women are obviously capable of sustaining a lot of injury that exceeds the natural levels of, of damage that a human body is built to be able to take. And then furthermore, they were, you know, what many would say spouting nonsense, but they were talking about having their organs taken. And so one of the uh, suppositions about this film is that maybe that these people were involved, these two sisters were involved in some sort of a genetics experiment, or perhaps even something that had to do with, as we would conventionally call them, super soldiers. I have spoken with a number of individuals who have had alien abduction-like experiences where they personally feel that they have actually been taken 
an experiment at all, and they say it wasn't anything that involved non-human entities. These were humans that did these experiments, and yes, they were very much involved in trying to create something, well, by all intents and purposes, that we would call trans-human out of need. Mm-hmm. And so some people would say that the ongoing uh, mythos surrounding alien abduction actually has more to do with secret government or other kinds of maybe even extra governmental, nonetheless, uh, you know, clandestine official organizations that utilize, uh, you know, certain factions of the U.S. populace and other parts of the world as well. And they take civilians for purposes of experimentation in hopes of trying to create superhumans. Who knows if that's what's going on, but, you know, it's a, it's a very strange film, and I definitely recommend uh, Madness in the Fast Lane to the people who are interested in this sort of thing. Yeah, and see, that's an extreme case where I'm not sure there's enough documentation behind it to demonstrate that that was anything more than some sort of anomalous i mean look we've all heard stories about mothers i guess the hypothetical mother who lifts the car off the baby i'm not sure who that was but right it's a famous hypothetical and it kind of dovetails into something i want to talk about on the other side of the break tonight but i'll I'll kind of dangle this out here because we're, we're, we're again we're talking about augmentation of the human biology expansion of the human capacity but at the same time one of my counter arguments to transhumanists and i'm not against it and i'm not for it is have we explored human potential in the raw in terms of what we really are um human beings do not completely understand their own power and i think for a lot of people one of the questions that comes up in dealing with uh, transhumanism specifically is are we stepping over boundaries prematurely believing that only technology can do this or is there another path to that yeah oh absolutely and and much like yourself and i know we're coming up on a break but I do want to say again, whether it be with Madness of the Fast Lane or any of these other anecdotal reports of, of ongoing changes that humanity may incur through the implementation of advanced technologies, you know, I couldn't tell you that there's evidence of that. I think there's some compelling evidence of something. Uh, and it's mm-hmm, sort of mm-hmm. with that, in, you know, that interpretation of what may be going on behind the scenes even today, in which case we might say rather than the singularity is near, we may say the singularity is here. But I, I don't like to uh, get too far, uh, you know, ahead of ourselves. Uh, and, and I think that many of the, the singularity uh, advocates out there would just as soon have us believe uh, that this is going to be, uh, you know, I mean, if anything, very much like a religion. It's going to solve all our problems, and humans are going to live forever yeah. with these kind of technologies. And that's one of the biggest problems that people, uh, you know, whether or not they're adherents or, or you know, uh, you know, I, I guess people who would stand, you know, against the idea of technological singularity and transhumanism. That's one of the big problems they have is that, you know, there's definitely a religious overtone to a lot of this. And so, again, I try to be kind of agnostic in this thing. <laughs> maybe there's something to all this, and I think we could learn something from it. Uh, and, yeah, I think that uh, once we reach that quote-unquote technological singular point, uh, it's going to really change a lot of our perception of strange phenomena, especially UFOs. But, again, I couldn't tell you whether that's either good or bad or whether it's, you know, something that we're really that close to uh, in relation to helping first understand ourselves. There are a lot of variables that have to be taken into consideration first. I think that's a good place to park it for this hour, Micah. We're going to take about a seven, maybe eight minute break here and come back on the other side. I want to draw in a little closer to the UFO side of this and kind of tying it together with understanding the singularity or vice versa. And uh, as well, questions from the chat room, and hopefully we'll get a chance to take some of your calls tonight as well. We'll do all that when we come back on the other side of Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Moggins, and we will continue very shortly, just as soon as I can find my bumper music. There we go. We'll be right back.
Planet Radio. This is Randy Morgans of Off Planet Radio. The human biology is under stress as never before. Environmental hazards, genetically modified foods, toxins in the earth and air, chemtrails, and escalating radiation levels. How do we get control? Thanks to the work of a team of researchers, we are pleased to announce a revolutionary natural technology that can help your body rebuild its original coating. RNA Drops is a completement formula based on the newly discovered iCell. RNA is the building block of DNA. These new DNA structures are the gateway to what is called ascension. Many users of the RNA drops have discovered the benefits of a product as unique as their own biology, finding newfound well-being, peace of mind, and a sense of control over their destiny. Like me, they are enjoying a sense of empowerment within their own bodies and emotions. To get all the details on RNA drops and to find out how you can obtain a free mini bottle, go to RNAgenesis.com. That's RNAgenesis.com. Welcome back to the second hour of Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Moggins. Offplanetradio.com, offplanetradio.net, and don't forget the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash offplanetradio. I'm still amazed that people go to YouTube to listen to audio, but apparently <laughs> there are aspects to the internet that I don't get either, and... Uh, People kept telling me this, and uh, the YouTube channel is picking up some pretty decent momentum right now, and I guess that's because we're uploading full shows there, so uh, very interesting <laughs> how that works as well. Uh, again, we'll be taking a two-week break following next week's show, and uh, the schedule is posted at offplanetradio.net and offplanetradio.com as well. And uh, my uh, my guest, Micah Hanks, is, is here with me. I'm fumbling to reach over here for a fader. Micah, welcome back to the second hour. It's good to be here. Before we go any further, we need to get your contact information out, tell people where they can find you, where they can find the book, and some of your various activities, because you're a pretty busy guy. Yeah, I certainly am. Let's start with the social security number. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we already have that. Thank you. <laughs> yes, of course. And the codes to your automobile. <laughs> well, um, Surveillance society being what it is now. I wish I could say I was double balled at, but yeah, that's the thing is, these days, you know, it's just not even surprised. <laughs> you might as well be used to it, you know. Uh, you know, there are ways to reach me if you're interested in the subject matter. And uh, the first one I'll direct you to is my primary website, triple w dot g r a l i e n report dot com. That's the Graylian Report, and there's a weekly podcast of the same name, which I produce as well. And of course, uh, info at Graylian Report dot com will put you directly in touch with yours truly. Uh, 
I also have a personal website, and there are other different kinds of things that are coming together, micahanks.com, and, uh, you know, really so much to try and keep up with. But, uh, you know, those are the, the key primary ways of doing that. And then uh, if you want to meet me in person, I do uh, speaking engagements and lectures at different events around the country. I think I'll be at the KGRA uh, Paracon in Kansas City, I think, this September. Uh, the, the, of course, there's always the Paradigm Symposium in Minneapolis, Minnesota in October of each year uh, that I'll be co-hosting and lecturing it with my uh, comrade, Scotty Roberts. And uh, we, of course, together do uh, Intrepid Magazine, which you can find online at intrepidmag.com. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on and uh, a lot of different ways to reach me, a lot of different things to discuss, even beyond the scope of transhumanism and UFOs, but I always invite people to uh, send their questions and queries or you know, comments and criticisms just as well. You know, it's keeping the ball rolling by asking the necessary questions and getting engaged and talking about things. Do you ever get, um, I want to say attacked, but maybe that's a bit harsh, criticized for being sort of contrarian in terms of not buying into the true believerism uh, that's rampant in some segments of ufology I, i'm entirely a contrarian if you want to if you want to use you know a, a pure definition for it and yeah i certainly am criticized i went on one popular uh, internet radio program the guest and i hit it off we had a great discussion and then his listenership uh, proceeded to rip, uh, rip me apart on the uh, discussion forums for the radio uh, the radio program, and the reason why is because they said this Micah Hanks sounds like someone who just is either very non-committal or just doesn't really have a grasp on the, the the pure formulation of what it is he actually believes. He just seems very undecided. I'm not decided, uh, uh, you know, entirely on on what UFOs are, and I'll be the first to admit that. And the reason why is because how do you decide and make up your mind about what quote unquote an unidentified flying object is? Damn people, you know, it's it's a much more complex subject than a lot of people are willing to accept. And you know, while I was at the uh, the Phoenix uh, International UFO Congress recently, uh, while for the most part people were very welcoming of my. Uh, non-committal approach to UFOs in terms of not committing to the extraterrestrial meme that so many others will assert, uh, which, again, I maintain that there's absolutely no proof of, merely some compelling evidence to support that extraterrestrial hypothesis. It's not an extraterrestrial reality. It's referred to as an ETH, extraterrestrial hypothesis, because it's still a formulated theory, and there's some good evidence, but, you know, again, no proof, and evidence and proof are different things. You know, I was in large part well accepted at that event, but, you know, at least one or two individuals came up to me and said, you know, how can you come to an event like this and try and talk about ufology outside the scope of ETs or alien beings visiting from other worlds? Because, I mean, doesn't the, the large body of information already pretty much paint the picture for us that we know what we're dealing with, and now we're all trying to work for disclosure and and thus there are people who also mm, mm, mm. you just hit the word the d word ah uh, <laughs> i get such a headache when this word comes up <laughs> because and i've been slammed as well because there is there is a segment to this and like i said to you in the first hour i've done considerable amount of research and interviewing of people who have had various experiences. I don't discount any of it. I want people to tell their stories. I want them to put them on the record. At the same time, the best witnesses, like the best investigators, hold these experiences out to be examined because they are, and the word here that, that sticks out is anomalous, because we're looking at things we have not been able to fix into the landscape of something and define it completely. And people like you, to a greater degree than myself probably, are dispassionate enough to be able to stand to one side and look at this phenomena from a wide view and examine it in a way that many people don't like because they are what I call true believers. Yeah, they've, they've given themselves to something that, again, one cultural and even at times scientific interpretation of uh, a technology, UFOs, in our midst that appears to exceed not only perhaps natural levels of intelligence uh, available to humans, which is a little bit more difficult to, to quantify, but more specifically, 
they also appear to exceed known technologies available to humans. Uh, you know, people have stood, you know, on, on the way or on the by lines, you know, and, 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 and watched UFOs in flight, or at the very least have read about, you know, others who have claimed to see these things in, in, in the way that they operated, and have said, okay, clearly we're dealing with something that couldn't be a technology of our own. But that doesn't mean that they have to be extraterrestrial. You know, one theory mm-hmm. that I look at with the, the UFO singularity is that maybe, you know, if, if indeed uh, advanced science uh, is implemented by future humans, it could be that future humans will utilize those kinds of science to manipulate space-time itself, and that certain aspects of the UFO phenomenon may be uh, a, a, what we would essentially call a technology emanating from our temporal future, and, uh, and there are a variety of ways that the, that kind of technology could interact with our present day. You know, and I, I don't like the term time travelers. You know, people no, I don't either. <laughs> I mean, it's really kind of silly, you know. Okay, we're going to build machines so that we can travel back and look at what we did, you know, 100 years ago. Obviously, we're interested in learning, you know, what ancient technologies may have been utilized to build the pyramid or something along those lines. Right, right. Sick token, I would argue that on a perceptual level, if humans get to a point, a transhuman point, where they are capable of perhaps, you know, exceeding the natural limitations of perception, you know, to the five senses, they'll probably also be able to perceive aspects of space-time very differently from how you or I might, and they may not have, a, you know, an actual need for needing to build a machine that travels back or forward in time. And furthermore, if there were, for instance, you know, technologies that allowed a complex matrix to be woven into reality, and you know, our future descendants may be more akin to being operators of a grand computer program that actually is able to manipulate aspects of space-time. Again, they may not have to have a machine that can take them physically, you know, like uh, Doc Brown and, and Marty McFly in a DeLorean, you know, <laughs> take them back in time. I, I think it's, it stands to reason that future humans may be utilizing synthetic processes and, 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 and technological programming, you know, akin to our computers of today, although much, much, much more advanced, probably so much more advanced that we couldn't even conceive of what, what that technology might entail on today's terms. But I think that that could also be, uh, you know, something that in the future uh, our descendants might utilize for purposes of exploring and understanding space-time. They may be able to study the, the past, present, and future through real-time simulations that actually tap into aspects of existent reality and perhaps even maybe our temporal present, their temporal past. I mean, there's so many different possibilities in terms of what may be underlying ufological studies. And, and really, even outside the scope of just UFOs, there are a variety of different things in what we call Fortiana, you know, strange anomalous occurrences that could be akin to those same sorts of things just as well. You know, it's, again, and I, and I point all this out just to say that if we take all these different possibilities into consideration, at very least, again, I couldn't scientifically tell you that I have proof that that's what's going on, but it helps us illustrate in our own minds that ETs and extraterrestrials may not be the only component. And however likely that may seem, it is only a theory, and it is only one of many existent theories that we have utilized in terms of trying to practically understand an existent phenomenon in our midst, which we call UFO. I need to cr- clarify something for people in the chat room because um, <laughs> it, it, it won't get heated. The term that I label true believers has to do with a specific stratum of the UFO crowd, I'll call them. They're basically a mishmash of New Age theology and ufology where they are channeling galactic councils and basically believing that um, the space aliens are going to save us and that goes into a whole separate riff but I don't want anybody to think that I'm debunking here the term true believer the way I applied it here was very specific and anybody that's listened to my shows and read my blog columns knows what I think about the galactic high councils and the bullshit that went on around 2012 which did not happen <laughs> and the economic liberation that was supposed to come once the ruling cabal was taken out by the good ETs. I think we have to separate those threads a little bit. So please don't don't get hyper with me. I think you know that I've been very uh, balanced about the way I've presented my opinions on that. So <laughs> just just to be clear, um. <sighs> One of the things that I, well, first off, what do you think time is, Micah? Because I've had this odd sense most of my life, and I've journaled since I was probably 13. I've written tons of stuff. 
that time is something that's more of an abstraction or a mechanism and not real in the sense of a linear stream. What's your take on that? Very similar to what you just said. I think, yeah, it's, it's an abstraction of sorts. You know, I think that uh, maybe at times even a distraction. Time is, is largely a perceptual illusion. And, um, you know, uh, parts of that uh, interpretation come from my own experience, my own mind's meanderings, and then you know, more often than not, you know, uh, ongoing discussions I've had with the people over the years, you know, who have helped me to uh, broaden my own understanding uh, of, of, you know, the nature of space and time. Obviously, Einstein did a lot, and, uh, you know, it's such a, a difficult discussion, and I want to point something else out here as I'm bringing Einstein into the equation. Now, I'm no expert on on special relativity or, you know, the, the, the scientific applications of Einstein's theories, but I do know this, that, you know, when Einstein, Einstein began to formulate his theories of what the nature of space-time was, uh, it was largely theoretical. And after... Yeah theories were published in his ideas, his general theory of relativity, it was afterward that experiments were applied to the studies which uh, people then, you know, after the fact, said, well, this validates uh, Einstein's theory, and as Einstein correctly predicted, for instance, time dilation shows this or that, you know, again, experimentation after the general theories were put forth validated Einstein's predictions, but there are certain points where, as we know, Newtonian physics begins to break down. Yes. Some would even argue that Einsteinian relativity is incomplete in many ways, and that, you know, once we get into the realm of quantum physics, uh, you know, our, our known processes and, 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 and practical understandings, uh, understandings of the universe, again, tend to kind of break down. And so I think that it's important to point out that... Uh, there, isn't, there doesn't seem to be one consistent, uh, as people try and uh, term it, a unified theory. Not to say that there won't ever be, but I think right now, existent science doesn't account for a, a grand unified theory that really kind of takes all these things into consideration and puts it all together into one, okay, this is the state of affairs in the universe and how it is. And the reason why, I think, is because, again, humans are limited greatly by our perception, which is why, in stark contrast to what Stephen... Hawking and others have said about philosophy and that philosophy is dead because science has replaced it. I argue that philosophy being a logical process of understanding the universe around us through, you know, human senses and, 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 and you know, in terms of uh, the limitations, perhaps, of human perception, I think that philosophy is very much still important. Uh, and I think that uh, we will never be able to utilize science in terms of utilizing, you know, practical applications and, 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 and processes and methods and experimentation that will allow us to fully understand the universe as long as we are filtering those practical applications and those scientific methodologies through human perceptual limitations. Okay, so that said, one fine example of a human perceptual limitation is what we call time. Uh, we perceive time and the reason why is because largely we are here in this moment, and every time I say I'm in this moment, that moment has already passed, and that has become what we call the past. And mm -hmm. what's interesting is that the human mind can remember. You know, we can actually store data that we have experienced in what we call the past, but we cannot store data about the future. I have mentioned time dilation. Time dilation essentially shows that time is not the immovable constant that we think it is and that time is quite flexible. And if anything, it is relative to a, a, you know, a variety of different forces. Uh, and uh, including gravity itself, including which affects gravity. it. Yeah, Gravity actually exerts force on the natural flow of time. And you know, one of the famous experiments is when you take two perfectly chronologically aligned clocks and you take one and put it on board an aircraft which is not only traveling at high speed, but further from the direct influence of Earth's gravitational field as it travels high up into almost near-Earth orbit and then comes back down, travels once around the Earth and comes back down and lands next to the original clock that it had been synced with. And now there's a slight disparity in terms of the passage of time relative to the two clocks. In other words, there are physical forces that uh, you know <laughs> act on the passage of time relative to the two clocks. So... This has been repeated numerous times, and of course this now shows that, again, one more aspect of Einstein's uh, general understanding of the way that time and, and space and the interrelationship between the two uh, you know, actually occur in our physical universe 
it, you know, correctly predicted this, you know, this component. But I think that, again, what we learn from that is that since time is not this constant, this universal constant, and it is somewhat pliable, and it can change, and it's not always constant or consistent relative to individuals, I think that what that has to say is that since time is not the same for every person on every part of the you know, planet Earth, for that matter, in every part of the universe, then maybe there are aspects of time that are, again, on a perceptual level, somehow rooted in how we've evolved in terms of you know, how we experience and relate to our environment. And if at some point humans are capable of exceeding the natural perceptual limitations that we have evolved to have, we also may be able to exceed the perceptual limitations that prevent us from maybe, for instance, remembering aspects of the future. And this is something I argue in the UFO singularity, and I think it has a, an awful lot to do with entropy. And without getting into a really long, drawn-out conversation about this, I'll just say this, that uh, you know, Stephen Hawking, even though I've criticized his statements about uh, you know, science in relation to philosophy, he's also said some pretty brilliant things about the, the way that the block universe and thermodynamic laws, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, essentially place limitations on the function of not only computers, but also the human mind being essentially a bioelectric computer. We can create order or memories, but the expense of heat loss, the entropic forces acting on the process of creating memories, you know, within the, the, the brain creates more disorder than the order that is created in the universe. And so naturally, memory function, he feels, probably has to cave to the thermodynamic arrow of time, as he calls it. And our, brain, our brains, our minds, our bodies, all things in our universe must, you know, act in accordance of the natural direction in which entropy increases toward a state of chaos that all matter eventually begins to take. And so in that sense... Hawking thinks that there's a strong case to be made that the mind has been, you know, well, has evolved, I suppose, to be able to remember the past because of the direction, the thermodynamic arrow of what we perceive as time, that we can experience the present, but we can't, due to entropic laws, remember the future. So what happens if, for instance, in the future we utilize advanced technologies, nanotechnology, reverse computation, all these sorts of things, and we literally reverse the natural effects of entropy, maybe not only on the body, as so many transhumanists predict that we'll be able to do and therefore we'll effectively live forever, but what if we also reverse entropy in its effect on cognition and our brain function and the function of the mind? We very well may stand to reason that eventually we'll be able to actually remember the future just as well. And so I think that time at that point will be something that human perception may be capable of getting around which brings us back to something we talked about previously. I don't know that we would have to have a time-traveling machine, you know, many, many, many centuries from now for purposes of coming back and interacting with our temporal past or what you or I might perceive as the present day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Technologies of the future may allow us to do a lot of different things that get around what I think is fundamentally a perceptual illusion that we call time. I'm still reeling from that one. That was... Uh, <laughs> because even the theory of entropy itself is sort of sort of a, a, a byproduct of a very old school physics. Okay. I mean, there, these are laws that are basically contained within the domains in which we've studied them. We do not have enough experience outside of our own galactic system at this point to know if those laws hold up or not. And observationally... We don't understand, you know, even the decay rates of light. I've heard people say that light does not travel, that it is, in fact, constant, and that there is no speed of light. And that's right. pretty radical physics when you, when you think about it. In terms of all that we've talked about, Micah, we've kind of been on the science side of this, and... You told me that your father was a, is a, 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 a theologian, a minister. Mm -hmm. uh, the spiritual side of this interests me greatly because I think many of the people who are adherents, this was my experience with the extropians back in the 90s, um, tend to veer more towards the science side of this. The idea that humanity needs to be augmented rather than perhaps what needs to happen is we need to be activated into things that we either already possess or have forgotten. There are all these ancient mythological stories of beings that were called gods who seem to have powers. There are these incredible structures around the planet 
megalithic sites that appear to testify to an intelligence that we no longer comprehend. So my question to you in the examination of the UFO singularity connection is, are we examining this strictly from a hardware software aspect or can we look at this from another dimension and kind of try to grasp the idea that inherently perhaps the human itself is a self-contained self-replicating upgrade system over time oh yes we, we certainly can look at it you know if, if people prefer to call it spiritual Mm-hmm. Okay, we can look at it that I way. I sort of danced around that term a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and, and briefly, I, I want to <coughs> come back to what we were just discussing, and I, I want to say, for instance, what we, again, think we understand about maybe entropy or the human mind, it may not always, again, on, on Earth terms, it applies pretty well to what we know of the universe, but, you know, there may be another planet with an entirely different gravitational force that's exerted, uh, exerted on the life that has evolved to uh, perceive space and time very differently on that planet, and organisms, especially very small ones on a planet like that, may, by virtue of the energy they draw from consuming whatever it is they consume on a planet like that in relation to their environment and the, the force of gravity exerted on them and all these sorts of things, uh, you know, you could already have life forms in the, in the universe that are very close to being near uh, negentropic, to uh, invoke a term that uh, Schrodinger and so many others wrote about, uh, you know, a century, or not centuries, but <laughs> several decades ago. So, again, you know, a lot of the, our, our, our understanding of science has to, uh, again, be applied uh, with relevance to what we understand on terms of earthlings, whether it be humans or other, you know, different kinds of uh, people who, or, or, or animal life, you know, all different kinds of life forms that have uh, come to exist here on planet Earth. Now, that said, one hot question that we have continuously dealt with, especially in, in, in the recent times with the popularity of programs like Ancient Aliens is, could advanced intelligences from other planets have come to Earth? And could those intelligences have already, uh, you know, assisted in, uh, you know, human, uh, you know, not only evolution, but perhaps even in the seeding of life as we know it here on planet Earth? Right, right. It, maybe that's the case. But, uh, you know, another interpretation that I've uh, enjoyed uh, to, uh, you know, to at least consider, and I'm sure that there are people who would call themselves skeptics out there, uh, as I tend to do, uh, who would who would say that this is absurd? Uh, and I'll counter it by saying, well, but by the same token, is is what I'm postulating in terms of what kinds of non-human human interactions may have taken place in ancient times. Is that any more absurd than to presuppose that for humans to have evolved to a point where we are intelligent on this planet, that the aliens had to be involved in so many ancient alien theorists out there do? Some of whom I know personally, who I've spoken with, you know, at length, and uh, you know, who've even spoken at events like the Paradigm Symposium, which right, I hope right. and yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing that uh, you know, I have said in uh, in contrast to the popular physical alien human interaction in ancient times, uh, you know, meme or mythos, if you will, is that maybe human, non-human interactions have taken place, but that those took place in a non-physical, perhaps even altered state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Furthermore, it may also be that, uh, you know, humans uh, learned to think abstractly through uh, altered states of consciousness, perhaps induced by hallucinogens that had nothing to do with aliens or any kind of non-human intelligence whatsoever, but nonetheless that appeared to mimic you know, if you want to call it a virtual reality in which that very sort of thing is taking place, much like many uh, experiencers, you know, uh, psychonauts, users of substances like dimethyltryptamine and other substances in modern times have described, whether or not that experience emanates from within the mind or if there is actually an extra bodily or, you know, maybe an off-planet experience here that involves non-human intelligences. It's anybody's guess, but I don't know that we have to assert that ancient humans had interactions with physical flesh and blood aliens, there could have been a variety of different experiences that were non-physical involving hallucinogens and the like. They could explain those very same sorts of experiences as well as a lot of the cave art that we see and all these sorts of things. And what's funny is that uh, people who want to just say, well, you know, you are thinking outside the box and therefore you're wrong, they'll say, well, that's just as the same thing as saying that, uh, you know, people were visited by ancient aliens. Again, I want to make a clear distinction here in that I think that hallucinogenic experiences that have nothing to do with aliens, but that perhaps created what we would call a mental 
uh, virtual state in the ancient mind that was more conducive to an abstract thought that may have led individuals to uh, you know innovations in who knows agriculture, architecture, any number of different things, the domestication of animals, even these sorts of concepts could have been learned through abstract processes created naturally within the mind as a result of abstract thought and altered states of consciousness. And the reason I think there's a strong case that can be made for that is because of the general level of creativity that users in modern times have expressed may occur. I still think that that is something that's worthy of consideration. We can't rule out the possibility, though, just to be fair, that perhaps there are also non-human interactions that occur just as well in that sort of an altered state, which is, again, something that the literature seems to... Yes, very much so, yeah. Yeah, many people who deal with altered states, and we've talked about this as well, report encounters with what we would call non-physical beings or beings who are uh, non-humanoid in appearance and functionality. But I'm interested in the idea of what you brought up with, you know, non-human interaction as well, because it doesn't negate the reality of the experience, especially if there is an expansion in capacity, capability, or knowledge that accrues as a result of that. Would well, you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think that <laughs> clearly an experience occurs. Yes. And, you know, uh, I wrote a book a few years ago called Magic, Mysticism, and the Molecule that looked at a bit of this. And uh, in the sense that time, with that, that book, I was, uh, you know, rather than making a case for, I was really kind of trying to, uh, you know, conduct an examination of people's claims of contact with extra-dimensional uh, non-human intelligences or different varieties, I guess, of Obsidian intelligences, you know, in all different states of consciousness. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I would like to expand on that more in the future in terms of saying that uh, whether or not the experience is evidence of an altered state that causes abstract thought, as we're kind of talking about here, or, you know, if a literal physical interaction with non human intelligences occurs extra bodily in that altered state, I don't think it really matters because. In my way of thinking, uh, if anything, abstract uh, processes, and at times very advanced varieties of ancient technologies probably emanated from these experiences. That, to me, I think is uh, at times maybe uh, an important component to what we would call the ancient astronaut theory. Actually, I think ancient alien would be much better because it removes astronauts from the equation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, and again, we do kind of come around full circle. It's been my thought for a long time that what we talk about, maybe in terms of the use of entheogens, hallucinogens, various mind-altering substances, even trance state, and my, my statements about channelers earlier, look, there is a component to contact with non-physical entities that I don't have a problem with. There are certain strata of that that I do. But having said that, would it not be entirely likely that at some level, as we move into technology, the, the two would stream together? In other words, the experience of a technologically enhanced consciousness would begin to actually resemble the use of hallucinogens or entheogens or other substances. And I come by this in a way, do you remember Second Life? Oh yeah, of course. Okay, so a lot of people really immersed themselves in Second Life to the point where some people were delusional. And it was this whole amazing construct that was put together. It's, you know, kind of dated now. But I remember online talking to people who were deeply immersed in in Second Life, and it literally, for some people, became Second Life. I encountered people who got divorces over it. I encountered people who racked up massive credit card bills and had to file bankruptcy. It was really, in terms of an immersive experience, quite astonishing to watch what happened there. And you'll see a similar thing as well with any type of what we would call non-real, non-physical reality construct. Do you see the place where what we would call the technological singularity almost slipstreaming into something that would be very similar to that experience? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we were to take things completely full circle here, what I would uh, point out first is that, uh, you know, we often talk about the problems uh, that could be, you know, inerrant to the creation of artificial intelligence. And yet we seem to be blissfully moving toward that, almost inescapably so. Uh, we are uh, hell-bent on creating something in our own image. And I can sit here in front of my computer and I can look at the way that a computer functions. And it's funny because if I have too many programs running, mm -hmm. the computer begins to slow down. Yes. You know, we can see, you know, whether it be relative to earth science or whatever else, you know, uh, we can see the effects of entropy on the function of the computer sitting in front of me. And it begins to slow down as there are many programs running on, on you know, on my MacBook here. Uh, in my mind, if I've got too many things bumping around in my mind, I'm worrying about a, a bill I've got to pay at the end of the day. I'm worrying about what the next book I'm going to write is. You know, I'm worrying about, you know, how I'm going to pay this bill or, you know, whether I've got to, you know, run across town and run an errand. You know, again, you'll, you'll start getting this kind of cloudy feeling in the mind. You, you begin to see that, wow, we design a lot of things in our environment, and they, they function either relative to humans or are even very similar to the functions of humans. And with artificial intelligence, here we are, again, you know, almost inescapably moving toward a point where we're trying to um, create something in our own image, which is exactly what, especially in Judeo-Christian spiritual traditions, God allegedly did when he created Adam in his own image. But did that mean that God is a, is a man, you know, sitting up there in the sky, and that naturally God is a human-like being or something anthropomorphic because we were created in his image? Obviously, I think that that's that 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 ancient parable is is you know rooted in, in myth and. In, mm -hmm. in, I, I agree with you, and I have a theological background as well. I agree with you on that. Yeah. Yeah, and, but but I would also argue this that uh, you know we could you know speculate, for instance, that if you really want to live forever, uh, one way to get around that is to get around physicality, and like we've already seen in two thousand one, Space Odyssey, you know when. Uh, when, uh, uh, oh gosh, it's not Major Tom, I'm thinking about the David Bowie song now. But uh, there, You mean HAL 9000? HAL 9000, you know, of course, was a computer. Of, yeah, Dave just, was, yeah. Yeah. And, and I love that film because really it, it has so many elements that, with regard. I don't talk about it much in the UFO singularity, but really so many parallels can be made there. There's the artificial intelligence, there's the humans that are you know, being kept alive, utilizing advanced future technology. We go. You know, in a manned uh, space mission to Jupiter, and then what does Dave encounter when he gets there? Essentially, this kind of psychedelic experience, right? Right. A and he, uh, in this psychedelic experience that he has, essentially has an encounter with non-physical aliens that literally take him beyond the confines of the physical body, and he's sort of, uh, according to one interpretation, at least, reborn as a star child, and that's the next stage in development of, or evolution of, of you know human uh, human kind, and so. It's very, very difficult to really understand exactly what Clark and Kubrick were getting at right there. I think there's something that would say it was this or that. There are really a variety of different interpretations. But following this line of thought, maybe the ultimate state of you know enlightenment is something that uh, exceeds physicality altogether. And let's say that we create advanced you know, non-human uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence that self-replicates, self-replicates, and gets to a level of advancement to where consciousness can be maintained and separated entirely from physicality. Then we have essentially some sort of universal, nebulous, non-physical intelligence. I wonder sometimes if that kind of an intelligence would do as it had done in reaching that point. The self-replication point was actually an ongoing, cumulative process of evolution. Does that intelligence at some point decide that it wants to experiment further, mm -hmm. and it creates, again, a physical variety mm -hmm. of life mm -hmm. in the continuation of its evolutionary process? You went in the same place that my headspace was going, because I think... Yeah. The expression of what we call God against the construct called man was a differentiation of the divine th theoretically to experience physicality, duality, and the contrast of, uh, of the human existence. So in, in a way, what you did was you basically did the loop yeah. because what we're talking about maybe isn't so now strange and weird to us even from a spiritual aspect. Yeah, and arguably, once we attain, again, what the transhumanists would call artificial intelligence, and we've got you know advanced technologies that can literally change aspects of our own physicality, people think like in Star Wars, you're going to have a robotic arm attached to you. You know, that's what we see today. Mm -hmm. Eventually, that technology, if allowed to progress uninhibited for purposes of good, would actually begin to mirror organic 
uh, uh, you know, substance. Therefore, a you know a bio uh, you know mechanical arm that maybe you know is used uh, you know a prosthetic arm that's used to replace you know a person who had an uh, you know an amputation or something like that occur. It's going to be uh, and I, again I can't tell you when this would occur, uh, uh, but following a logical progression of technology that in the future would be allowed to progress un, un uh, you know hindered and uh, you know probably to a point of of, of goodness and practical use. Uh, this person would be fitted not with a mechanical arm, but at some point would be fitted with a uh, a, a naturally um, rendered, or rather a, a mechanically rendered arm that was natural and appeared to be biological, but was nonetheless synthetic. You know, again, I think that we'll get to a point where our technology will allow our very best technology to mirror what we call biology and perhaps improve upon it. And so, sure, yeah. I mean, you've got nano nanoparticles that can theoretically fuse themselves into mass and simulate, if not completely replicate, right. natural tissue. Absolutely. And again, you know, the nanotechnologies that the futurists of today are talking about, what comes after that? You know, once, we've, once we have, have instituted practical uh, everyday use of nanotechnologies in, in a few decades, what kind of technologies will we be talking about then, <laughs> if talking is even still something we have to do to construct those <laughs> You know, topics? talking is, is like, I, this is something that I've experienced. Uh, talking, I think, will become a, by, uh, a bygone era, because I think it is a very slow way to concept. To, to communicate concepts and I think you get that too as a writer um, yeah. and somebody who does talk radio your mind speeds ahead against the stream of speaking of being able to write to a place where you can't keep up with your own concepts anymore oh of course absolutely and you know uh, my, my study of uh, you know transhumanism and advanced technologies and, and the like you know it has led me at least into the, a cursory examination of, of such things as what we might call synthetic te uh, telepathy uh -huh. a lot of people have again said you know it seems that the smarter we get the further we get away from something that we once as humans were capable of doing and i don't think there's any scientific proof whatsoever that it you know at one time we were all going around reading each other's minds but i think that a, a case could be made that you know in a sensory way uh, at one time in, in our uh, evolutionary um you know progression throughout time uh, to the uh, current state of, of humanity that we exist as as a species, uh, I think that maybe humans utilized, uh, you know, a, a more intuitive way of interacting with one another and that, you know, certainly aspects of that intuition, that natural intuition, have been supplanted by the use of practical, uh, you know, mechanisms and, and, and technology that we utilize today, which have not only bettered our life, but, you know, in a lot of ways have also created much greater and further reaching connect uh, connectedness across the globe. You know, many people who I correspond with and uh, you know, who I have, uh, you know, brilliant conversations with, I don't know about the brilliance emanating from my end, but, you know, they're brilliant individuals who, you know, gracious, uh, graciously bestow knowledge on me during uh, uh, conversations. Uh, you know, we, we have these conversations via things like Skype, you know, and Facebook mm -hmm. emails from halfway across the globe. Yeah. That's just incredible. One day, maybe I'll be having a conversation with someone, you know, uh, on a space station or maybe another planet. We'll be utilizing technologies that, again, connect us in ways that we haven't been able to do reliably in the past. And you can say, yeah, in the, in the ancient days, back in, in Atlantis, you know, we all were constantly connected, you know, utilizing, you know, intuition and whatever. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that was the case for a while, no, but we're, uh, we're utilizing technology to create the exact same thing and in a more practical and reliable way. And again, I don't know that it's necessarily that we've lost something important. I think it's just that we are evolving and we're utilizing our environment to aid ourselves in that kind of evolution that is going to not only put us more in touch with one another in a way that some say we already have been in the past, but it's probably going to do so in a more effective way that we just, you know, we, we haven't been able to do reliably up until now. That actually kind of closes an, a loop on a positive note as well, Micah, because I, I think even my viewpoint at some times has been, and it's cynically, just as somebody who works in technology and, and deals with the, the present day hardware, I'm like, holy shit, you mean I got to sit around and wait for an update from Microsoft before I can do something? Or <laughs> I've got to defrag, what, uh, my RAM chips or my ROM chips? Or, you know, and cynically, I'm like, you know, technology is great, but the consumer side of it ain't so great sometimes. I mean, uh, 
I look at computers and I mean I'm constantly buying technology and upgrading it and dealing with it and I'm like yeah. in some ways it doesn't feel that far removed from the 80s in oh, terms yeah. of the frustration factor and I'm like god am I going to have to deal with that with my 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 functioning whatever it is in the future huh. well you know sometimes I think that uh, you know the technology itself hasn't really progressed all that much but what we've managed to do with the technology is we've allowed ourselves to uh, expand our minds to a point you know and we, we, we <laughs> you know here we are talking about we damn near found it it's the Higgs boson we're sure this time we weren't last time but this time it's almost certain that this is what we're with <laughs> Well, that's great, but, you know, again, we're utilizing technologies that allow us to perceive, even on a microscopic or even a, you know, a much more introspective than mere microscopy, I guess. We're looking at things in, in a way, in, 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 at the world around us, within the world around us, in ways that are causing us to think differently. And really, the greatest thing about technology today is not really what it allows us to do, which, as you correctly pointed out, hasn't really, in the last few decades, changed all that much, as many people would say uh, or had expected years ago that it would. What it has done is it has allowed you know human perception to evolve to an extent, and we're every day changing, reforming, and revising our perception of what reality really is. And that's perhaps the most exciting thing about our own technological growth and adaptations that we're uh, seeing occur and, and grow and expand every single day. We're changing ourselves is what's happening, and eventually the technology may catch up. I want to make some space here in the last few minutes. I know I didn't open up for calls, but uh, anybody that wants to call in or if you have on the chat room any questions or comments you want us to entertain at this point, I want to get those in as well. I've been trying to watch the chat room, and sometimes it gets away from me. But uh, right now, if you want to call in the last few minutes, 717-910-0544, or on Skype, just type in my name, lowercase Randy Moggins, and uh, you can touch base with us here for a few minutes. We'll, we'll run it past the hour if we have to. Um, in connecting the UFO and the singularity, this is kind of a, is this a, a sort of, I guess, scheme that you plan to develop a little bit more, Micah? Do you, is, 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 can you take this and extend it out a little bit further? What, let me put it this way. What is the future of ufology based on what we see now? In other words, how many conferences can we have and continue to discuss what is so not the latest breakthroughs because I'm not seeing a whole lot of cutting edge stuff out there, but maybe you are. Well, you know, I don't, I don't claim to be, uh, you know, in, in contact with extraterrestrial beings who are feeding me special information, nor am I in contact with a lot of people in, uh, in government who are, uh, and of course somebody's going to read into that and say, he's had a lot of people. So in other words, he's got some inside source, you know, I mean, I think if you do this long enough, you're going to be in touch with people in academia, you know, people who live in the space program, uh, you know, a few people who've actually, you know, worked in upper echelons of government, you know, branches like, you know, uh, you know, operations uh, or office of special investigations in the Air Force, you know, different things like that. You know, sure, I've spoken with, like every UFO researcher does, plenty of people who have been in clandestine positions, you know, of, of you know, intelligence and the like, and who've experienced weird things. And I'll tell you this, too. I've never encountered anyone who, who pointed me in the direction of there being an extraterrestrial reality that is being kept from the public. I know a lot of people dispute that, but, you know, again, <laughs> you read books like uh, John uh, Alexander, uh, Colonel John Alexander's latest book um, on UFOs, which, uh, you know, <laughs> within the first few pages kind of point out that, uh, you know, many of the, the better, brighter thinkers in ufology today are like me, they've never come across clear, hard, undeniable proof of an extraterrestrial reality underlying this. Again, that's one possibility here. I think that one of the key things we have to do here, if we're going to keep going to UFO congresses and, 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 and UFO events and paradigm symposiums and anything else, any other kind of an event that's going to you know, realistically look at trying to solve or claim to have a solution or, or an understanding of the UFO and then, but is we have to look at what works and what doesn't work. And in my opinion, uh, you know, we've, we've batted around back and forth, up and down, and around town twice over or more, uh, this idea that ETs are visiting Earth, and, and really how much closer to understanding this phenomenon has like, gotten us, you know? There are a lot of people out there who think that uh, ETs are visiting Earth and that they have been since the end of the Second World War and that they're here to help save us from ourselves and to prevent nuclear proliferation and things like that. 
you know, for all you or I know, Randy, and, and, and to your listenership and anyone else up there around the globe, maybe that's really what's going on. But, you know, <laughs> the first problem I have with that is that if aliens are armed with, you know, high-tech lasers and a bunch of, you know, gobbledygook that's going to, you know, allow them to disarm our nuclear weapons sites, I don't necessarily know how I... Uh, you know, like the idea of there being an intelligence that essentially is right here in our midst and they're carrying a much bigger stick than we are. <laughs> North North Korea is a big enough problem. I don't know how I feel about a, a, an extraterrestrial, uh, you know, interventionist race that's here in our midst and that they're capable of disarming our nuke sites. What does that mean that they could do if they ever decided that they got tired of us, you know? And people, you know, again, in the absence of any clear proof or evidence, they look to this extraterrestrial meme not only as a solution to the UFO myth, but also as a kind of a weird comfort, as kind of spirituality or religion in itself. They, they, they literally look at this and say, these guys are not only here, but they're here to help us and to save us and protect us and solve all our problems. They're trying to give us advanced technologies that can cure every disease known well, to man. I, and, you know, that is the flaw. And this was what I was kind of raging about earlier, is... We're still looking for solutions outside of ourself. And I would think that anything more intelligent than us, outside of us, would be following some sort of prime directive, if they're benevolent and not interfering. And I have to believe that one of humanity's great hopes, beyond even any singularity or anything, is that they learn how to solve their own problems because the other side of the singularity is we may just blow our asses up completely unless we get a hold of the human side of us that needs to wage war. And yeah. that's the part of it that I think is really kind of the, well, another X factor. We have to take, you know, we have to take all these things into consideration. And, you know, I guess, you know, really kind of just to summarize what I was saying there, you know, something that I suspect you'd probably agree about, uh, you know, we, we can't, First of all, assert that UFOs are extraterrestrial, and second of all, that that is going to solve all our problems, you know. And I think that in relation to singularity, people kind of make the same faulty assumption that, oh, well, we don't need to worry about whether or not we can get a girlfriend or whether or not, you know, we're going to die of cancer or whether or not this or that's going to happen because when the singularity gets here, it's going to solve all our problems. There's a lot of, you know, <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of a, you know, a leap in philosophical and, 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 and frankly, in, in logical judgment that occurs uh, because people are always looking essentially for some kind of an escape mechanism, and more so than being a fundamental reality or a component to the reality within which we exist and function, you know, ufological studies and, you know, singularity studies and things like this become kind of a convenient meme. It's just another escape mechanism. Some people, it's far more simple. They go to the bar on Friday night and they drink themselves into oblivion and that's how they escape. Or they get lost in a video game or in Second Life, you know, which I actually created a Second Life account and started experimenting with a little bit when I started writing the book, The UFO Singularity, because that's, again, another mm -hmm. component to all of this is, you know, how virtual reality will begin to you know, change uh, the way that humans interact with one another. Uh, it's going to be fantastic for the porn industry, I can tell you that. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> you hit on that. I mean, cyber sex, you got to... Um, it takes things to a whole other level. I have a question in the chat room, and I need to ask this. Um, they want to know um, how you interpret... The f hard film evidence of President Truman speaking openly of UFOs and being discussed in meetings or astronauts discovering them. I think you touched on that earlier. In other words, uh, there does seem to be, from the standpoint of the question, uh, some idea that the government has knowledge or that they have suppressed knowledge of, of UFOs. Yeah, that, that is a good uh, question. Uh, often when I say I've never seen proof that UFOs are, are extraterrestrial, for instance, people have uh, said to me, uh, well, what about what Buzz Aldrin said? Or what about, you know, what uh, this president or that president said? You know, or my colleagues, Grant Cameron, of course, has done a lot of research into the, the obvious connection between past U.S. presidents and the UFO enigma. Mm -hmm. Again, we have to look very carefully at the language that we're employing here. And, uh, you know, not again to sound like a contrarian, but I, I do want to point out that UFO does not mean spaceship. Many people utilize that term UFO in relation to the discussion of extraterrestrial spaceships or, you know, extraterrestrial intelligences that are presumed to be interacting with humanity. But really, what a UFO means is the old Air Force term that Edward Ruppelt 
first instituted, and then it was later used by the Canadians, and then it had a similar counterpart used in the, in the Spanish-speaking in other countries like France, uh, you know, OVNI. Um, but UFO means uh, unidentified flying object. There are a lot of things that could be unidentified flying objects. Now, have past U.S. presidents spoken about unidentified flying objects? Yes. Uh, have astronauts not only talked about unidentified flying objects, but literally discussed uh, seeing UFOs uh, while conducting space missions? Yes. Gordon Cooper in his biography even talked about flying saucers in an incredible experience where he said that a flying saucer touched down uh, on a, I think, a dry lake bed. This was prior to his uh, time as an astronaut. Uh, and that he actually managed to film this, and he reported, and he actually uh, passed the uh, the footage that was made of the flying saucer landing right there in front of him, passed this along to one of the superiors, and it was, of course, you know, yeah. taken and, and examined and then disappeared. Yes, there are certainly instances where people in official them have talked about seeing UFOs. Um, there have also been official accounts where people have interpreted phenomenon they have either studied or experienced themselves as being an extraterrestrial phenomenon, but that alone does not constitute evidence of ETs visiting Earth. It only proves, in my mind, one thing, that A, official organizations have taken great interest in unidentified flying objects, and that evidence is in the documentation that has been released, not just by the U.S., but by virtually all the major uh, you know, military bodies and intelligence agencies around the world. They may not be telling everything that they know, but disclosure that people keep harping about has been something that has been ongoing for a long time. The British government, you know, I think every few months or so they release a few more of their documents yeah, from their archives. Exactly. The Canadian, mm-hmm. I've mentioned the Canadians have had archives. The U.S. has archives. You know, as a matter of fact, on my website, GraylyInReport.com, um, I have an article that I really need to uh, revise and update and repost because I go into the, uh, you know, the, all the different countries around the world that I've been able to find. France, you know, parts of South America, parts of, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, not only Europe, but also Russia, North America, you know, all these countries that have released declassified UFO documents. So clearly what it shows is that different world powers have taken an interest in UFOs. I don't think that that conclusively proves what we're dealing with yet, that we have to take all the possibilities into consideration and accept the fundamental underlying fact that there is, I think truly, as many others have said before me and many more to come will say, there is a valid and real phenomenon, and I think at times a very physical phenomenon. We just don't know what it is yet. And I think ultimately that is what we're dealing with, and I think your presentation of that uh, <clears throat> kind of gives us another way to look at the situation and uh, why we need to have good inquiry, why we need skeptical inquirers. And I know that there are people out there who don't agree with some of the statements you made tonight, but you stated them from your best efforts. And uh, again, the book, uh, tell people where they can get the book, Micah. Absolutely. The publishers are uh, New Page Books. And, of course, the book is The UFO Singularity. You can find it at my website, www.gralianreport.com, also at newpagebooks.com and on amazon.com. Or if you want to be old-fashioned about it, you can go out to bookstores everywhere. Just ask for Mike and Hanks, The UFO Singularity. You'll find that, uh, in addition to a, a few other books that I've written, Magic, Mysticism, and the Molecule, and, and several others. Amazon's always a good first place to start looking. Absolutely. Mike, it was great having you on, finally connecting with you and getting a chance to, I think, do some pretty deep probing into singularity transhumanism and ufos and uh hopefully we'll get a chance to do this again my friend anytime uh stay on the line a minute i'll close the show out just a reminder again next week the 27th my guest first hour everett halford second hour crystal clark and james c horak will be here and we will be back next week with another show the truth is out there it's inside you keep looking for it we're out of here for the night guys 